Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Wednesday Wanderings. Uh, thanks for joining us. It's good that you're uh, taking part in and this little time of devotion of, of uh, thinking uh, upon a scriptural passage this evening. So thank you again for joining us. Now, I don't know where you are tonight, but here in Armagh, it hasn't been the nicest of days. It's been grey. haven't, as you can see, I'm wearing my fleece. I haven't felt the need to take it off all day. Maybe you're watching from somewhere nice, like uh, like on the coast uh, or uh, somewhere else on your holidays or whatever the case may be. If you are away, I hope you're having a brilliant time and I hope the weather's better than it is here today. Just grey, grey, drizzly old day. Uh, but hey, hopefully better days are ahead. Um, I'm going to read to you tonight from Exodus 14. And as you know, um, with our Wednesday wandering, we're thinking about different biblical characters from the Old Testament. Tonight, we're thinking about Moses. And you know what? There's a whole series we could do on Moses. Moses is a huge character. Um, and there's so much to say and to, to think about in the life of Moses. But tonight, we're thinking about what happened in Exodus 14. The plagues have just happened. Um, Pharaoh has let the people go. And uh, they now have approached uh, the shores of the Red Sea. So Exodus 14, beginning at verse 10. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and they cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us here to die in the desert? What, what have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you see today, will ne you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch it out, your hand out over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through the chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. And then the angel of God, who had been travelling in front of Israelites, Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved in front and stood behind, from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness on one side and light to the other, so neither went near the other all night long. And then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water to their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all the Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army, and he threw them into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving, and the Egyptians said, Let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and the chariots and the horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak the sea went into its place. The Egyptians were, were fleeing towards it and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and the horsemen and the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through on the sea, uh, through the sea on dry ground, with the wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and the Israelites saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. Let us pray. Loving Lord, as we uh, ponder upon Moses and uh, this, uh, just this amazing story, we ask that you would bless us and help us to have faith, 
Help us to trust in you as the one who is strong, who is mighty, who is mighty to see it. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Now, as I said, uh, this is the story of Moses and uh, what that we're thinking about tonight and his people. And, you know, we join the story in quite a predicament when you think about it. Just to do a wee quick recap to let you know how we've got to this place. If you remember, the Israelite descendants of Jacob were enslaved in Egypt. For population control purposes, a death sentence had been placed upon the Israelite baby boys. Hoping for his life to be spared, Moses' mother uh, put him in the basket on the river uh, Nile. And of course, he was rescued uh, by Pharaoh's daughter and adopted as her own. And then in adulthood, Moses came across an Egyptian beating an Israelite. And so he intervened and he actually killed the Egyptian. So um, Pharaoh found out about it. He had to flee. He fled for his life. And in Midian, he met a family who took him in. And uh, he worked for 40 years uh, as a shepherd for his father-in-law, Jethro. And then he received that great, um, I guess, that great instruction from God uh, through the burning bush. And, uh, and so reluctantly, he found himself at Pharaoh, uh, going back to Pharaoh. Um, and this is a sec another Pharaoh at this stage. And uh, having to ask for the release of God's people. Of course, Pharaoh said no. The plagues came and, uh, and following um, the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh eventually relented and so uh, the people fled. Uh, the exodus happened and, uh, and then, of course, Pharaoh changed his mind as we joined the story and Pharaoh, his army, began to pursue the Israelites. He wanted to get them back because they were thinking, gosh, how are we going to do all we're going to do? We haven't got our slaves anymore. And, uh, and then the story uh, continues. Now, it's interesting that in verse 4 of Exodus 14, we read that God told Moses that he would harden Pharaoh's heart and that he would pursue the Israelites. This was always going to happen. Uh, verse 4, But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. God had something to say in this. He had a point to make. And so the Israelites were impeded by the Red Sea. They had nowhere to go. The, the, the Egyptians were coming up after them. You know, they were in a, an awful predicament. And they were terrified, we read. And uh, they cried out to God and they cried out to, to Moses. They quickly forgot about how God had released them through the plagues and all that had happened before. They quickly forgot about all that because they could see the Red Sea, Israelite, uh, Egyptian army coming to them, and they were in between. Um, but, you know, uh, it's just amazing when we read the words of faith that Moses then declared in verses 13 and 14. It shows how far Moses had come from being the guy who was absolutely terrified about going to Egypt to ask for the release of the Israelites in the first place. He says to them, and his leadership now, leadership qualities, he says to them, in faith, do not be afraid, stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And that's the wee key verse I'd like for us to remember tonight. Those words of Moses to the Israelites. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. What great promises Moses was able to declare to his people. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. You know, our world, of course, is in a predicament of an unseen enemy. The virus that has come upon our land and our world, you know, it came upon our land with a wave. It has largely been overcome, but at any time it could advance again. It hasn't gone away. And, you know, there's obviously, there's a lot of talk now about uh, what the autumn and winter might bring. That's what we're sort of starting to begin to think about, having been through this first wave. And, of course, in many countries, the presence of the coronavirus is only in its first wave and it's advancing at a frightening rate and it feels relentless when we listen to the news and see what's going on in our world and our land. It feels consuming. It feels overwhelming. Just remember that verse uh, that Moses declared to his people. Something for us to hold on today, that we're not alone, that we have a God who fights for us. But, and as people of faith, 
amidst this presenting issue, or indeed whatever form of oppression that we might face, we will do well to listen to those words of Moses to the people of Israel standing on the shores of the Red Sea. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Now there's two important things uh, that I'd like for us to be mindful of as we take encouragement from this verse. We cannot just take it loosely as, as something that we just say, right, that's what God promises. We don't need to worry about a thing. We need to be mindful of one or two things here. All right. First of all, it, this is not an excuse to pray and to do nothing. All right. This is not an excuse to pray for God's protection and ignore all of the health service can, uh, advice and all the rest that we've been given. Yes, we should pray for God's protection against this situation or whatever situation that we're fearful of. But we should also trust, uh, you know, in the advice that we've been given by wise and, and learned people. We are to trust in the knowledge that the all-powerful God is with us. He's always present. He's always loving. He's always good. He is with us in each situation. But we should also take responsibility by listening to the advice that we're given by people who have been enabled to understand more than we do. Let us have faith in God and in those he has appointed to guide us. Prayer is an outcome of faith. It is a recognition that we need God and we need the people he gives us to help us. You know, there's a wee saying that we often hear, God helps those who help themselves. That's not what I'm saying. And it's a completely unbiblical viewpoint anyway. It's a lie. What we see here in this passage is an example of how God helps the helpless. When we are mindful of our need of God, and when we submit to him and seek his help, then we're in a position to receive from him and often it's through people in, in particular roles and positions. There is no inference in this special little verse that we should pray and do nothing. Nor is there any uh, inference in this passage that we should take matters into our own hands and forget about praying. That's completely opposite to what it's saying. Yes, we are to pray Yes, we are to have faith. Yes, we are to leave whatever it is that is worrying us and, and causing us fear within at the feet of God. But we're also to listen and, and to respond in the right way, according to what we are being told by certain people. The second thing is that Moses and his people's circumstances were a situation that God created. It's a, it's a, it's a specific situation. In Exodus 14, verse 2, as I said, you know, God gave his instructions to the Israelites to where to go. But he also said to Moses, you know what, they're going to come after you. There was a plan here. There was a plan. And this place, Baal Zephon, was a, a most vulnerable location where he was sending the Israelites to go. It was like running into a dead end street uh, when you're being chased by someone who wants to cause you harm. Humanly speaking, this was a crazy place to go for people who were trying to flee the Egyptians. Uh, Pharaoh must have been delighted when he learned that's the direction you're going. He must have thought, gosh, these people have no clue. However, it was a trap for the Egyptians that God had set. Being hemmed in between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army was God's intention for his people. It was all part of the plan. He brought them here, guided by the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire to follow at night, as if the infliction of the plagues and the supernatural guide to follow weren't evidence enough of God's care and his plans for his people. He had more to demonstrate. He had more to show his people and the Egyptians. He had a plan to demonstrate that he is God who looks upon his people with love and will care for them always. Here was God going to fight for his people and they needed to learn how to trust him. So now they're on the shore of the Red Sea with an advancing army. Uh, you know, it's not to say that it, it's God's desire, however, to, to be in situations that we're in. He, he desired for them to be in their situation, but sometimes we find ourselves in situations that are not good. And this is not to say that God wants that for us. Our predicaments are not necessarily of the Lord's choosing. Sometimes, of course, we bring things upon ourselves by our silly decisions that we make. 
And we can look back and we sort of thought, gosh, I got that really badly wrong. Sometimes other people's decisions cause predicaments to, to be inflicted upon us. Sometimes what happens to us is a consequence of the, our fallen world. And there's no, there's no sense that we can find in what happens. The whole interplay between circumstances being of God's design or otherwise, you know, it's beyond us. And it's, you know, it's a really difficult thing to, to engage in. And, you know, sometimes we're just better off letting it be. Um, but what we see here is that God distinctly told Moses what he was going to do. This was clearly a plan of God's to demonstrate who he is and what he wanted to show. So on the shore... Moses' reply to those frightened Israelites was very apt. Do not be afraid. Stand firm. You will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And what followed, of course, in the passage that we read, um, it's an event that will, has been talked about ever since and will always be talked about, the, the great deliverance of, of the Israelites uh, from the Egyptians. A couple of little things uh, that follow, of course, in that story of the going through the Red Sea. First of all, God commanded the Israelites to move forward. Verse 15, the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. You know, it's almost kind of comical, isn't it? Why are you crying to me about it? Just get on with it. He's sort of saying, there's a small matter of the Red Sea in front of the Israelites. But Moses was told by God to tell him to press on, keep going. It was a dead end in many ways, but God was going to go through it. And there's real encouragement for us there. Sometimes what we can see in front of us might seem a dead end, but God's the one who can press on through. Secondly, God moved the cloud from above to behind them. Verse 19, the angel of God who'd been traveling in front of the Israelites, Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. The cloud, pillar of cloud also moved from front and stood behind them, verse 20, coming from the armies of Egypt and coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness on one side, light to the other, so neither were near the other all night long. So the cloud blocked the Egyptians from seeing the Israelites, but it also restricted the Israelites from looking back and being filled, filled with fear. What a great and merciful act of God. And, um, you know, blocking but also uh, preventing the, uh, the Egyptians coming forward but also preventing the Israelites from seeing something uh, of which they're afraid. Thirdly, then God parted the Red Sea. Verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and that all the night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it dry land. The waters were divided. Now we can only imagine the amazement of Moses and the Israelites uh, watching the divine wind howling down through the water to the water's bed, drying it so that the Israelites wouldn't get stuck in messy, soft, boggy uh, river or seabed. And as at once uh, they were able to, to get through that channel, uh, you know, of course, they were followed then by the Egyptians. But then God did a fourth thing. Uh, another miracle, another wondrous thing. He brought confusion on the Is Egyptians. Remember what Lord told Moses back in verse 18. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. And in the channel created by the seas parting, the chariot wheels got stuck. And the Egyptians didn't know which way to turn. And then under God's bidding, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea at daybreak and the sea went back into its place. The Lord swept the sea over uh, the Egyptian army and none of them survived. The Israelites were well and truly free. They need not fear the Egyptian oppression any longer. God had delivered them from bondage and terrible uh, slavery with shock and awe. And you know, when we're in a predicament, let's remember this story and let us seek God's help. Let us seek the one who delivers his people. At all times, let us know that we can look to him for guidance and for delivery, deliverance.
from what it is that we're suffering and being oppressed by. Let us trust that he is at work and can intervene in remarkable ways. Let us know that we're never alone. Verse 31 concludes this chapter with these words. When the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. You know, tonight we can take encouragement from that. We can look back and, and you know, just take encouragement from it. Whatever situation we're, we're in tonight, whatever we're fearful of, whatever it is that we feel that is hemming us in, you know, we can look in faith to the God who delivers. He's the one through his son who delivers us from the consequences of our sin. He grants us salvation, the greatest freedom that we can know. He guides us amid life's journeys and he can help us overcome what we're faced with. He can help us through. He can take us through. And he enables, of course, us to be part of his great mission of salvation, redemption, of kingdom coming in his world. We have a good God, a mighty God, a merciful God. And, uh, you know, we've got so much to give thanks to him for tonight, despite what it is um, that might be wearing us down. And we're all feeling weary at this time with this whole Corona thing. And uh, we know that it's not going away anytime soon. Um, but we can take heart and strength from the God who is mighty, who is mighty to save. So let's pray for a few moments. And just as we begin, let's just take a little moment in quietness and let us recollect the presence and the love of God. The one whom Moses spoke of when he told his people, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Let's take a moment, closing our eyes, just taking hold of that statement which Moses offered to his people. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Now perhaps we feel as if we're in a bit of a dead end. A circumstance with uh, no real way out. And we don't know how to respond to it. We don't know what we're supposed to do. Let us know that we're not alone. That God is with, him, with us and before him we can be still. And we can believe, we can trust in him. Father, we come to you tonight as people who are ultimately helpless. If we've learned anything of late, Lord, it is that we're all vulnerable, that for each of us life is uncertain, and for all of us we have much cause for concern. But Father, we thank you for the promises and assurances that we find in your word and the knowledge that by your spirit you are with us here and now and at all times. Help us to be still. Help us to trust in you, the God who is for us, not against us. Help us to see your ways in times when we feel perplexed. Help us to know that you are with us and grant us the support around us that we need at times such as this. Let us take heart from the story of the Israelites and their exodus through the Red Sea. May we be people who live by faith in you, the God who is loving and gracious and good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray tonight for all people whom we know who may fear like that of the Israelites entrapped by the Red Sea and the advancing army. For all people for whom there seems to be no escape, we ask for your intervention. We pray for leadership, for the well-being of vulnerable uh, people at the very heart of his decisions and actions. Father, we are becoming increasingly aware of the entrapment that many feel in refugee camps, amidst, especially amidst the growing threat, threat of coronavirus. In places where fear, escape from fear is virtually impossible to conceive, we ask that people will be afforded that reassuring care of being known and cared for. Please bless organisations such as Tear Fund and Christian Aid and all organisations that are seeking to provide essentials for life in places where life is at its lowest ebb. 
May we who have been blessed with much be mindful of those who have so little. May we seek to help with provision and upholding one another in prayer with faith in the one who encourages, encourages his people to be still. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for all who face the daily struggle of depression, of anxiety, of mental health conditions that rob us of peace. We ask that you might bring your light into dark places of our lives and help us to see the hope that is found in you and better days that are possible for us all. Please be close to all who suffer from addictions and help them to know the support that they need to overcome. Father, as we have seen in your word tonight, you're a God who delivers us from bondage, oppression and fear. Please bring healing to the lives of those who think there is no escape from the trials that they know. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And I conclude our thoughts this evening using the prayer that is the second collect of evening prayer. Lighten our darkness, O Lord, we pray, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night, for the love of your only Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Folks, thanks for joining us again this evening on Sunday. Uh, we're thinking about another Old Testament character. We're actually going back a wee bit because we're going to be thinking about Jacob uh, in on Sunday morning. So please do join us for that, our family service on Sunday morning. And uh, yeah, folks, hope, uh, hope you're all keeping well in the next wee while and hopefully we get that chance to meet again soon. God bless and good night. <laughs>